Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Axelrod, editor of Culture Cheese, Culture the Word on Cheese, and I'm excited to be filling in today for Stephanie Skinner because we have a really fun program for you. We're here for a fabulous cheese board building experience hosted by Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, featuring their education manager, Molly Brown, and Alicia Norris Jones, the cheesemonger at Mars Community Brewing in Chicago, where they are, both Molly and Alicia are there, and that's where we're hosting this really exciting hour of cheese deliciousness. Um, not incidentally, Alicia received her CCP through the Sartori Culture Cheese Scholarship, and she's also the subject of voicings in our first issue of 2021, the innovation issue. First, a few housekeeping notes. At the top or side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Please post your questions and comments there. I will be reviewing them and asking Alicia and Molly to answer them as appropriate. And if I don't get your, to your question during the program, um, we'll uh, pass it along to the presenters and they'll reach out to you directly. And we love your insight and participation. We always get great questions, great comments at these virtual countercultures. So don't be shy, share your thoughts, uh, comments on the pairings, your favorite pairings, and anything else cheese related that you think we'd like to know. And now I'll turn it over to Molly and Alicia. Awesome, thanks so much, Susan. And hello to everybody who's tuning in from around the country. Um, wonderful to see so many familiar names uh, popping up on my screen here. This is always a highlight of my week when we get to see so many, um, you know, well, friendly faces, if you will, uh, from abroad. So um, like Susan mentioned, I'm um, reporting live from Mars Community Brewing in Chicago. Um, I have to say the thrill of stepping into a commercial space uh, for the first time in about eight months was unparalleled. Um, so this has been a really fun uh, class to put together. I'm really excited to share what we've got with you guys um, today. Um, Alicia has been a dream to work with um, and she and I have collaborated to bring you guys um, an amazing selection of Wisconsin cheeses. Um, obviously, it was very hard to narrow the playing field uh, here for our cheese board building class. Wisconsin, as you know, is the state of cheese. Uh, we make more than 600 varieties of specialty cheese in our state, uh, and it's just hard to pick um, on any given day, which Wisconsin cheese do I feel like eating? So we've brought to you um, a collection of five cheeses um, and a, a whole um, set of accoutrement, um, sort of born from Alicia's, uh, you know, genius pairing brain. Um, so she's going to kind of lead us through um, the process of, um, you know, how she selected the cheeses, how she selected the pairings, and then how to put everything together um, on a beautiful plate. So with that, I am going to turn it over to her. Okay. Hey, guys. My name is Alicia. Um, I am the current cheesemonger at Mars Community Brewing down in Bridgeport. And gosh, I think I've been in cheese for about like five or six years, did the whole ACS TCP thing, which was amazing. Definitely think about doing it if you haven't done it yet. And yeah, now I'm here. Um, right now, like due to the pandemic, I've been making a lot of my own cheese boards under the name Immortal Milk on Instagram. And it's been really cool, like kind of this whole like backdoor cheese plate situation. You've done on me, a guy comes out and is like, here's your Spanish cheese, please pair it with Verdejo. So yeah, it's been pretty rad. Um, so today's cheese board is going to be festive. And actually, before I walk you guys through that and like what we have, I just want to show you my station. There's any way that we can like focus. Beautiful. All right. So we've got our cutting boards, all of that. Um, I kind of grew up in restaurants. So I really do like the whole like Bain Marie thing and try to have all the tools that I have out already, like mise en place. You're probably familiar with that term. It's really just about setting yourself up for success. So we have a chef knife, a paring knife, a couple of cheese tools, a jigger for later, and then scissors, a couple of spoons. I forgot, nope, I have my tweezers. And then hot water. So whenever you're actually like plating like mustard, jam, and you don't have like 5 million spoons, a Bain Marie of hot water is going to save you. And what else do we have here? I also have some plate wipes extra ram cans, a coop for later, and my cutting board. And then you're gonna see me wipe down with either a towel, I have some wet wipes as well. And yeah, so this is my station and it's going to get insane as we go through this. So I apologize, I have a Virgo ascendant, so I like to think I'm very organized, but I'm chaotic. So 
Um, before I make a cheese board for mortal milk, I like to have an idea. So this idea, like you can think about it like a thesis. Um, what is the point of your board? What is the mood? What's the season? Like, obviously we're working with Wisconsin cheese. So we're gonna be working with a certain region, but also like, what do you want your guests to feel? How are you going to plate? Who is your favorite like visual artist at the time? Um, I love Jackson Pollock, so I end up doing lots of splats and like kind of like more abstract plating styles. And I really think more mongers should look at what folks are doing in fine dining in restaurants to get like a bit more inspiration for cheese boards. Cause like, there's nothing like going into a restaurant and being like, cool, I've seen this like cheese pairing, cheese pairing, and I'm bored now. Like that sucks for you. That also sucks for your guests. Like everyone's bored. So let's not do that. Let's try to break a board. So the other things that we can consider while plating, like who's your audience? Like, what do they need? Are they conservative? Do they want to try something new? Are there kids? Are there like pregnant folks? All of that. And we also want to think about what type of event we're throwing. Like you're not going to do one cheese, one pairing plated like you're at Noma if this is going to be a party where everybody's watching football. So like really just keeping in mind like where your board is going to be. And again, what kind of mood are you going for? If you're going for like a wedding that's like big, bounteous, like celebration type thing, you're not gonna have a meager board. So like really just plate how you feel and then like that'll translate to your customers. Yes, I'm sorry. And yeah, so we have some cheeses going on. Um, this board, like I said, is going to be festive and festive for me is like whiskey, chocolate, cranberry and I really wanted to stay away from things that you would find at like say Starbucks you know and like think about more winter fruit winter chocolate and like winter Christmassy like region our traditions from around the world so hopefully we achieve that today definitely let me know what you think about what we have going on but yeah Jesus <laughs> So uh, I heard the first rule of cheese plating here is all about the vibe, right? Like, yes, just get yourself in that mindset, let the vibes come to you and let the spirit move you from there. Exactly. So yeah, vibe, intent, audience, and I guess dietary restrictions as well. Um, I, and actually thank you for breaking in there. I forgot about one more thing, squeeze bottles please use more squeeze bottles. It's gonna like help make your plates so much like more uniform, it's easier. You're not gonna get covered in mustard. There's mustard in here. So go to your like local Whole Foods or Restaurant Depot and buy like 12 of them cause you're gonna lose like half of them. All right, so yeah, festive, holiday, non-denominational. You're hanging out with your conservative uncle who doesn't like blue cheese. There are some kids there. We're not really sure if they can do raw milk cheeses. So like, let's have a mix there. Um, super cool friend from Manhattan who's been to Momofuku and you want to impress them, but also not think that like you're impressing them. So like, we're gonna play it like really easy and cool. So accessible, hip, um, different contemporary, but still like enough for that one uncle not to like yell at you and say like, you're trying too many things here. Cool, all right, so cheeses. First up, we have St. Savior. Oh yeah, you can see this right here. St. Savior from Hordes Dairymen. And Hordes is located in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. Um, so this is going to be a Camembert style cheese. This really reminds me of Mount Tam, but like with way more like pudgy pudding things going on with the paste. And then definitely like lemon, button mushroom. I would say a little bit of earth as well. And like this rind is absolutely gorgeous. So that is gonna be our first cheese. And then right after that, we have Tennessee Whiskey Bella Vitano from Sartori, love them. And so like other cheeses in the Bella Botano series, this cheese has been washed with a liquid um, or like really just like flavored. And this has been washed with Tennessee whiskey. I don't quite know which whiskey. Molly, do you have an idea? 
You know, I tried to do some research on that and um, they don't identify a brand whisk, a branded whiskey. So I think that um, it may, either, maybe it changes from time to time or um, they're keeping their cards close to them, their pocket. Totally them. fair. I mean, the minute you say like Evan Williams or something like that, then like everybody comes out and like makes a giant deal. The price of the cheese triples. Absolutely. <laughs> Although I would like a bullet cheese. That would be super tight. That would be. Uh, <laughs> um, we can make so, a bid for next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I throw that out there. Sartori, if you're watching. Um, so like, okay. So the Bella Batano series is like, five or six cheeses, probably more than that deep. And I would say this is on the sweeter side for a Bella Batano, but not as sweet as raspberry Bella Batano, which has been washed in a tart raspberry ale. Um, I actually really, re not actually, I love this cheese because I feel like the caramel notes from the whiskey actually penetrate the cheese and like highlight the paste in a way that like raspberry or Herbs of Provence don't or balsamic. So super, super good. And again, like this is so approachable again for that like uncle and like anybody else who's a little bit worried about trying something super super new and they need something to anchor them with oh huh <laughs> do we have an issue yeah hold please <laughs> two while seconds you're, while you're doing that alicia can i uh relay a question absolutely uh, uh, Carrie wants to know, how do you feel the wash of whiskey changes the flavor profile of the cheese? I, so Bella Batano and all the ones that I tried, I feel like it really, it wants to be a sweeter, more like dessert-like cheese that the balsamic and raspberry don't allow it to. But with this, you get, or with the whiskey, you get more butterscotch. You get more like... I don't want to say Molly Arbor reaction because like that's not quite what I'm going for. It's just a bit deeper, I feel, to where you're actually paying attention to the cheese and like the crystals that are inside. Does that make sense, Carrie? I don't know. Sounds good to me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sure. No, I think this looks this looks good, right? Yeah. No, we're good. Um, yeah, I think just like the whiskey highlights the actual texture and what I think the Bella Batano wants to do, which is to be a bit more like deeper profile cheese. Um, cool. So we have Saint Savior, whiskey Bella Batano, and then, so pasteurize, pasteurize. So one of the cool things about the St. Savior, um, Hordes Dairyman is actually one of the oldest dairy companies in Wisconsin. Um, they, like Alicia mentioned, they're based in Fort Atkinson, which is uh, like 45 minutes outside of Milwaukee, like kind of between Milwaukee and Madison. Um, and the William Horde was the founder and he also like launched a whole like huge series of um, dairy innovation efforts um, in Wisconsin. And since the 1870s, they have been publishing the Hordes Dairyman um, which is a like a leading dairy industry um, publication. Um, so very cool. And they re just recently started making cheese. Um, their cheese is made with 100% Guernsey milk. Um, and the cows that are on their farm are descendants of the original cows from the 1870s, which I learned today and I thought was very cool. I wanted very to make cool. sure we share that with you guys. That's so surprising that they just like got into cheese making because this is phenomenal. I know, I would really <laughs> want to know what were they doing with their fluid milk? prior to making cheese. They could have been shipping it to a cheese, you know, another cheese factory. Um, you know, the style of cheese making in Wisconsin is really um, sort of the cooperative model, you know, where um, farmers usually send their milk somewhere to be um, turned into cheese and vice versa. Um, so it could have been a relationship like that, but um, what a delight to have um, a bloomy rind cheese also coming out of our state. That's something that's really right. Rare. We don't have a lot of soft ripened cheeses in Wisconsin. So when this hit the market, I was pretty much like, Oh yeah, <laughs> we are going yeah. places now, people. I'm very exciting. Absolutely. I'm so, and like, thank you so much. I'm so excited to like try this with everyone. And like, I haven't seen many Bloomies come out of Wisconsin at all. Okay, so my favorite cheese. I love all cheeses. I don't, like I, I just lied and said like, this is my favorite, but like, I love everything, but like I have such a like giant cheese crush on both Chris Rowelli in crown finished caves. I think maybe this we just, just need to be a thing that keeps happening. Just pull it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
we were trying to be fancy with a backdrop and it's now just creating more havoc than anything else so yeah well you know so guys i work in a brewery um these are merch cages it's the holidays <laughs> and things are happening <laughs> uh cool all right so crown jewel from roelli cheese house and crown finish caves so if you guys don't know crown finish caves is located in brooklyn new york they are aging in old beer lagering tunnels underneath the city i think is it Brooklyn or is it Red Hook? It might be like one of the two. Um, they are phenomenal. They make some of my favorite cheeses like uh, Barn Burner, Tubby is phenomenal and I am in love with them. And I hope they're watching and they know that I, I feel very strongly. And then like Roelli, like God, like Red Rock is amazing and like such like a sleeper hit on most cheese boards they do. Um, it's a really good way to kind of trick people into trying blue cheese. I'm like, I love cheddar. I hate blue cheese. I'm like, how about both? So it's crown jewel. A gateway blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, very much so. And so you can kind of see it here. Uh, crown jewel is going to be an unpasteurized cow's milk cheese. I would say in the Appenzeller style. You can kind of see a little bit of tear scene there. Um, it's been aged. Do we know what the age is on this, Molly? It's like usually 15 to 18 months. Um, and the cool thing about this cheese is that Chris has selected a single farm from his network um, to purchase the milk from. So it is a single source uh, farm milk, which is, uh, you know, just un it's unusual to find those in the marketplace. Um, and just another layer of what makes this cheese so awesome. Phenomenal. Oh, and um, crown, crown finishes and crown heights. I always am like, where is it? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's literally in the name of the place <laughs> <laughs> intense i love it exactly right <laughs> um so for this cheese i get notes of i'm smelling it um toasted hazelnut fresh fruit and a little bit of cave there as well from the lagering tunnels and this is it's so good and i'm so happy that they were able to send this out to us um is i is this on the market yet do we know you know, I know you can purchase it directly from Crown Finish Caves, and I, I would assume that, um, you know, it's in their distribution network, but that's a great question. Heard. Yeah, I want like 20 pounds of it. Um, cool. And then up next, we have Valmy from Door Artisan Cheese Company. It's going to be another wash cheese. And this is similar to say like Chimay and the fact that it has been washed in a Trappist style ale. And this is really an ode to Door County's uh, Belgian population. And what I really love about this cheese, again, like it's so approachable. It's like you get mushrooms, soy, a little bit of like cured meat in there and it's going to melt well. It's gonna pair well with like mustard and cornichons. And again, for that uncle who doesn't wanna try anything new, here's a new thing for him to try. And you can also talk about his favorite beer. So props to Door. I've never had this before this class and I'm so, so happy to be introduced to it. And then finally, that's Lami, we're gonna talk about her later. Uh, we have Car Valley's Pentacream. Um, so talk about a gateway blue, super, super creamy. Like again, fruit. What fruit would I say? I would say berries. Berries and cream with like a hint of blue. It's creamy enough that even folks who are afraid of like trying a blue cheese will still be like kind of called like some sort of like siren situation to try it. Um, this is kind of like my workhorse cheese where I don't quite know what I'm pairing with the given blue, but she can do chocolate, she can do honey, she can do pears, she can also do charcuterie, or you can also do a s'more. Like really anything, pentacream is like good with being thrown at her. Um, also, I would think about Chicharron Cracker Jack. Really, really good with this cheese. Cool. So that is our walkthrough. And this is the board that we're lo looking at. And I have plated on everything from a six foot table for a wedding to teeny tiny little charcuterie boards um, meant for ants. And really what you have to think about with plating is one, how people are gonna eat it. Like, of course, we're gonna leave the rind on, but are we giving folks toothpicks? Are we giving, are we asking people to use tongs that they're actually probably not gonna use um, because that's the way it is? 
Um, are we asking like people to use their hands? And is this a party? Are you just putting this like out on a table? Are you gonna replenish? All of that. So looking at this plate, I'm going to say that I have to keep it tight. I have to keep it compact. Um, the cheeses are going to overlap. So we're going to actually try to individually portion things so people can like pick up a piece of cheese and put it on their plate and walk away for the next person to come in. So yeah, long, narrow, and then as far as flow goes. So we always wanna have movement whenever we're plating. Um, again, like I like to think of cheese boards as a like vanitas or something like that a Dutch master would do. And there's always like a flow, like either it's like a fountain coming out of a cornucopia or it's a straight line. Um, it keeps it visually interesting and it also keeps you from like making really weird decisions with plating. So with this, I'm going to say horizontal, straight up and down. We'll see if I'm actually sticking to that. I can show you guys my sketch. It's not gonna make any sense. Hey, Alicia. Here. Yes. Can I interrupt you with a question? Absolutely. So um, someone, HR Puff and Stuff wants to HR know, Hey. <laughs> did you just reference Chicharron Cracker Jacks without any further explanation? <laughs> <laughs> it's to really make sure that you are listening. Um, <laughs> cool, Chicharron Cracker Jack. So um, Mars Brewing is located in Bridgeport, which is right below Pilsen, which is one of the largest Mexican-American neighborhoods outside of Mexico. It is, if you ever come to Chicago, please come down and eat, support the locals. Um, there is, oh my God, what is it called? El Milagro that makes the super dope tortillas makes chicharrones and they're like the curled up kind. So they're really easy to portion out. So what you do, chicharrones, pop your popcorn, make a super dark caramel, toss everything together, bake it off, throw some malt and salt in there. And there you go, chicharron cracker jack. You can throw peanuts in there, but since I don't really know who's coming through with a peanut allergy and like, I can't really ask my bartenders to like ask all of the questions that they need to, I try to keep nuts out of like most accompaniments. But I would say like red skin peanuts would be really, really good at that. And HR Puff and stuff, if you want to hit me up on Instagram for like the recipe, I can totally hit you or like hook you up. <laughs> um, cool. Hopefully that answered your question. And yeah, so here's my terrible sketch. Um, I know Lilith Spencer does something similar where like you're just trying to have an idea of what you're going to do. Sometimes it doesn't always work out like that. <laughs> it's already like so much more elevated than any cheese board I have ever made. I usually just am like, well, there's the cheese, there's the board. Let's put it all together. <laughs> so um, that's why I don't make Instagram worthy boards though. So well, I defer to the master. Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks. But um, let's let's call this a cheese breed. That's gonna go this way. Ooh. So we'll see if that happens. <laughs> cool all right guys i don't know about you but i've got all my stuff to follow along as as well i've got my uh raleigh crown jewel my valmy um, from door artisan my saint savior my <clears throat> whiskey Bellavitano. um so i've got my board and my knives i'm all set to go too we definitely encourage you to follow along if you're set up to do a live plating um if not you know we know you'll learn a bunch of cool tricks and tips to pull off an awesome board sometime this holiday season for you and your loved ones. So I actually feel like this is a safe space so I can just keep my notes out here while I cut. So thank you guys for making me feel welcome and talking about Chicharron and Cracker Jack. Um, so I'm gonna try to talk and cut at the same time. Well, I theory. think that's like, that's one of the main, um, uh like one of the key parts of being a cheesemonger right is being able to keep the conversation going while not removing a digit instead of yeah. the cheese <laughs> so it's fun because like i work and i mean i do my cheese stuff in a kitchen so i'm usually screaming at the chef like are you trying to ruin my life while not removing my fingers so um yeah that totally is part of being a monger and just like a person in the world what can i do to keep myself happy understood, heard, and everybody on their toes. Um, God, look at this. This is just- I think like when the cheesemonger says the paste is supple, 
That's oh. what they mean, right? Is like wanna... exactly that. Yeah. So um, I, let's talk about like descriptor words. So like you can say supple for sure. Um, what are other words that you can say to a guest to really, oh, you are just doing your thing right now. Um, supple, pudding, slick, swish, crunch, crunch, very different. Um, when it's I like the difference of, between chunk and chonk, right? Exactly. Like there's a chunky cat and then there's a chonky cat. The chonky cat. Um, <laughs> very different. <laughs> and when I think about pairing, because like we all know about the whole, oh, you know what? You're beautiful and you're perfect. And this happens. So we're going to do that. And we're going to see we can make it a little bit prettier. But she keeps oozing out. Like, I don't want to get too mad at her. Um, <laughs> so when you pair, am I mad at you? Hey, Alicia, I think that the camera, your overhead camera got knocked a bit. There's my pinky. Yeah. Are we good? We hope that you guys really appreciate this um, rustic video production uh, brought to you exclusively from Molly Brown, the education manager of Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, who is now moonlighting as a video protection tech for all live <laughs> events. So if you need any advice, I've learned a handful of things on this journey, but I wouldn't start <laughs> with me. Um, you have to talk to your cheese to let them know that they're doing a good job or else they will revolt. Uh <laughs> So with pairing, like we all know about like uh, complementing or complementary, complementary cheese That's pairings, fine. contrasting yeah. pairings. But I would also like to think about texture. So you don't want to pair something like a triple cream or Canada style, like what have you, with something that's equally as like squishy or smushy. Um, you want something that's going to be a bit more brittle or really something to like oppose that paste and look that, that opposition will actually highlight the paste. Um, then another thing that we all know, but again, like I feel like kitchens do like a really good job of it is paying attention to the role of acid. Um, acid is key in every pairing that you do. Um, more so in wine and like food in general, I know beer is a bit more about like bitterness, but if you had a lower acid cheese or something that is on the fattier side, you want your accompaniment to contain a ton of acid. So that's why we're gonna like do this pairing that we have coming up with the Saint Savior of the plum shrub from Mad Maiden and a little bit of sparkling because it's the classic for a reason, acid in the wine cuts fat. Cool. All right, so that is our pudgy baby doing her thing, looking real hot. Um, we're going to clean her up in a little bit, but next we have the whiskey Bella Vitano. And I think for this, shape is so important when you come to like a party board, festive board, because you're not always gonna be there to explain things to your guests, right? So you want to be able to be in the kitchen and someone walks up to you, they're like, hey, you're the cheesemonger. You like put this like thing together. Um, what cheese am I eating? You're like, cool, what shape was it? And if everything's gonna be a triangle, that's gonna be really, really hard to or figure out what shape or what cheese they were talking about. So really, again, like you're gonna wanna, gonna wanna keep things interesting for yourself and interesting for your guest, but also easily identifiable. Yes, darling. I skipped ahead, you guys, and I paired the St. Savior with the shrub with a little bit of sparkling wine, um, and it's really good. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. Molly and I, we've been up for hours, so we need a little bubble break. Um, yeah, so shape. And I really learned that when I started serving, and like every cheese plate at like the publican or like what have you would be plated the same way. So I could not actually look at the plate and be like, cool, uh, cubes of bright orange cheese, barn burger, I got you. Here's everything that's going on. And it's just, it's a step of service and a way to make your guests feel safe. This is for later. 
and happy. This is just gonna keep doing this. So please just tell me what's going on. All right. So we have two wedges of the Bella Batano. And then up, so Saint Savior, Bella Batano. Up next, we're gonna do, I wanna wipe this down first, the Crown Jewel. And again, I'm so happy for you guys to try this. So Chris Raleigh was the first cheesemaker who ever let me into his facility when I was a brand new baby cheesemonger in 2011. Um, oh. One of my favorite memories. And um, I mean, his cheeses are all amazing, um, of course. Uh, the, but literally the first time I tried Dunbarton Blue Cheddar as like a baby monger, um, I shed a single tear um, because it was so good. And I lived in Colorado, uh, but I had grown up in Wisconsin and like it was so evocative of like a traditional Wisconsin cheddar, but it was so delicious. And it was like the first time I really understood the idea of terroir because I was like, that is, that tastes like the grass I ate in my backyard when I was a little kid, you know? Um, it was, it felt so homey to me. Um, so his cheeses are always, always have a special place on my board for sure. Our centerfold for the innovation issue is going to feature Red Rock. Yes. Oh, the God. coolest looking cheddar, I think, with that blue veining. Yeah, and that um, beautiful, uh, the contrast with the annatto colored paste is just gorgeous. Yep. So I already tripped myself up here, but we're gonna make it work. So I changed the positioning on this a little bit because these two cheeses, the Crown Jewel and the Bella Batano have a similar shape. So I want folks to be able to see the rind a bit more. And we're also just gonna do it in a different direction and see if that helps with our theoretical uncle who's not listening to us anyway. I was going to say, Alicia, you like captured my family dynamic like, pretty much perfectly. <laughs> is your uncle a Packers fan? Because like that's, I, I oh, feel like his name is Jeff. They all are. are they, they, no, I don't have an Uncle Jeff, but I could just as easily. <laughs> but um, last year on Christmas Eve, like we always have a big family get together and there's usually like traditionally been a dinner served. And last year there wasn't for the first year. Um, so I, of course, had like a huge cheese board. And that's where everybody clustered for like the whole night because it was the only like substantial amount of food that was there and nobody mm -hmm. had eaten dinner because they were so used to dinner being served. Um, and it really threw everybody for a loop. But the people who spend the most time there were my cousins from Manhattan who definitely have been to Mama Fuku. So, oh my God. On the head. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. For my Thanksgiving, I made a clay pot chicken with friends from Manhattan and we had Rush Creek Reserve and a little bit of crown jewels. So I'm just like, I'm cool, I'm hip, I'm with it. Y'all love me. I'm trying, but I'm not trying. So yeah, I apologize for like rearranging because of nuts. I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, Mark Edwards wants to know, um, he said, I like the shape. However, how's the shape balance sharing some of the rind with everyone? Shouldn't everyone get to share in what may be the beautiful flavor of the rind? Ooh, that's a good point. And Alicia, right. you're gonna have to turn your camera again because your arm keeps going in front, I'm sorry. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really good point. So everyone wants to get a little bit more of the rind, really be able to taste it. Well, I feel like this is all pretty equal. Sorry, I keep doing the thing. But this, that can also be solved by portion size. So mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, definitely. You know, you always want to cut cheese to have um, when you're, in, you know, portioning individual bites of cheese, you want to definitely, and actually when you're cutting retail cuts, of course, you want to make sure that you have like an equal um, rind to paste ratio on each piece. Um, mm -hmm. That's what will help keep the piece balanced and give everybody, you know, the full sensory experience of being able to taste from sort of the interior of the wheel, you know, through the exterior towards the rind. Um, and Absolutely. of course, we'll distribute uh, the rind more equitably um, on your retail pieces as well. So that's something that's something that's super 
important um, to keep in mind. That being said, this crown jewel is like a totally weird shape of cheese um, to have to try to do that to. So I cut mine, I went really rogue. I didn't follow Alicia's directions at all. I cut mine, it looks like this now. But I ended up with like these beautiful little chunks that I made into like their own pretty braid going down totally. the board. So that's one way you can do it. Um, and even if the rind doesn't look exactly the same on each piece, if you just, if you consider that um, rind to paste ratio, that's the thing that helps me keep it um, in mind. You know, that the um, that same amount of rind roughly should be on each portion. Totally. So hopefully this is a little bit better, but actually thank you for saying that because that is totally. We also have a comment. Um, Erica says that the Sartori cheese has coconut flavor notes. Ooh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, coconut. Are we talking like fresh coconut, coconut milk, toasted coconut? Like. So um, coconut flavor is really driven by um, a family of aroma compounds known as lactones. Um, mm. It goes actually a lot in blue cheese as well. Um, so it's really, that was an interesting um, note to make for sure, because I often get coconut um, on a variety of cheeses. Totally. And I would say this is actually a bit more like coconut ice cream for me. Um, there we go. Sorry, my head wrap's going to keep doing that. Um, I think we might need to like rotate the phone 90 degrees. I can't yep. see. Is that better? No. <laughs> this? Let's try that. Okay. All right. Cool. Coconut. I like that. Perth. But I definitely, I just tried the Sartori cheese and I get a little bit of that, but I don't know it's, whether it's because it was just suggested to me that I'm tasting mm -hmm. the coconut. <laughs> it's like when you're tasting wine and someone says it's leather and totally you know, you're like, oh yeah, that does taste like wine. I don't know. <laughs> a freshly cut garden hose. That's my favorite um, wine tasting note that I've ever heard. It was in that movie, Psalm. And I was like, really? When was the last time you smelled a freshly cut garden hose? I'd like to know. <laughs> What's the difference between a freshly cut garden hose and like a one that was cut a month ago? You know, <laughs> is there a discernible difference? Um, also, say like garden hose? Yeah. Yeah, strange. The garden hose. I've never gotten that on cheese, but maybe I'm just not trying hard enough. <laughs> um, so this is the Valmy. She's real great. I think my favorite wine note that you normally find in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is uh, Cat Pea. That's always a fun one. And like knowing or like mm -hmm. seeing like who's the cat lover in the audience. That's just like, yeah, right. I have that. Yeah, <laughs> I have, I, I do appreciate that people just started calling it caddy instead of cat pee, cause that's like so gross, you know? But oh when you hear it's like, oh, it's that wine is caddy. I'm like, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> we have another question from Andrea. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite sour beer and cheese pairing? <sighs> wow. Um, Duchess de Bourgogne, and I'm not going to say it correctly, Marc de Chambertin, it's like a poisse, a cousin. Um, those two are phenomenal. Um, there's something about like the combination of the cheese and the beer, which has no chocolate notes, but like together you get like bacon, chocolate, cherry flavors. Um, mm. That's just amazing. And then Mars actually does a beer called Delinner Weiss. It is a dill flavored Berliner Weiss that goes really, really well with Gruyere and like strong mustard. That's another fun one. It's kind of like having a pickle back in a can. All right, so we are running out of room right now. So we're going to do one of these. 
knowing that it's going to be beautiful for two seconds, but that's okay. Everyone's going to get that Instagram photo. <laughs> Um, I'm loving this comment that we just got to that wet fox is another wine description because it's true. Who has smelled a wet or a dry fox? <laughs> <laughs> I hope to one day smell a wet fox. If you get I mean, close enough, it's a dead fox. <laughs> right. Cool. All right. How did you do the Valmy? I'm up to that now. Oh, yeah. Oh, so beautiful. A nice fan fun. there. Yep. Still a little fan. A little fan tan fanny. Um, so I set it up just like on its side, I guess. Sliced off the rind and then just kept like portioning out. Yeah. And then okay. that'll create a nice little fan. All right. Got it. Cool. All right, Saint Savior, Bella Vitano, Crown Jewel, Valmy, and last but not least, the Pentacrine. So there's a bit of a flavor progression there, but I mean, it's not too bananas, like from sweet, or sweeter, sweet, getting a bit more savory there, definitely savory. And now we're moving into sweet again slash our dessert pairing. Yeah, we have so much good pairing stuff here. And then let's see what you do actually. Hopefully my station's not looking a little crazy right now. There we go. So I found with pentagram, it's just really nice to just cut a wedge like this rather than trying to go vertical. Yeah. Kind of likes to break apart on you, which there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not what you want. It's not what you want. That's not what we want right now. But blue cheese too. I mean, it's so high moisture. You can kind of just put like a chunk there and people could almost, you know, just serve themselves like a softer cheese. Mm hmm. Mmm, so creamy. Great. How is this looking? It looks good. Cool. All right. So, a um, couple of caveats here. I don't like how close this is together, but that is okay because it's going to like if this was at a party, it's gonna get like decimated in two seconds anyway, and people are like okay with their cheeses touching because their cheeses are gonna touch inside of them. <laughs> um, but I am a big fan of negative space and I would like a little bit more here. Cool. All right, so we're gonna move into accompaniments. I just want to clean my board really quick. <clears throat> Are you trying the pentacreen? I am, yeah, it's delicious. I just unwrapped the pan for today to go with it because as you know from previous experience, I like to skip ahead. <laughs> in my pairings. <laughs> Word. Okay. Um, so this is our cheese. We've got it anchored on the board. We're going to give this a quick little wipe because I already see some crumbs that I don't love. And then we're going to move on to our pairings. So this is a little bit of water just to kind of get this up. Cool. All right, so our first pairing is going to go with St. Xavier from Hordes, and it is going to be Mad Maiden's Plum Shrub. And if you guys aren't familiar with shrub, it is a vinegar-based sweet syrup. So think of it as like the, what is it? 15th century, 17th century England forefather to soda syrup. If you have been in, in Chicago, uh, Portland, or New York in the last couple of years and like gone to a cocktail bar, you've had a shrub before. They're also called drinking vin vinegars and they're super, super popular in like Thailand, actually most of Southeast Asia and like a way to preserve fruit. And what Mad Maiden has done here is preserved the summer bumper crop of plums from Wisconsin and turned to a syrup. 
So she recommends doing about one or two ounces and depending on what you've actually brought through and I hope you can see my beautiful glass. Um, depending on what you brought to this, I would say two ounces if you're using seltzer, one ounce if you're doing a sparkling wine. Um, this could work with beer, but I would think about doing a Berliner, a Berliner Weiss or any other type of sour because you just need a little bit more acid with this, in my opinion. Um, but I'm kind of an acid head. So this is about an ounce right here. Alicia, I've got a couple more questions or actually Alicia or Molly. Yeah. Um, Erica wants to know what vegetarian options would you suggest as accompaniments instead of meat? Ooh, um, hummus, baba ganoush, roasted veggies, um, dukkha, which is a Middle Eastern spice and nut mix that you can do hazelnuts, cashews, sesame seeds, whole coriander together. Uh, that on the side with a little bit of olive oil and crackers, phenomenal. What else would I do? Um, fruit leather, dehydrated vegetable chips for sure. Vegetarian pate, so mushroom pate, vegetarian terrines, like really you, there's so much out there. And again, like this is why it's nice to look at what fine dining and like actual restaurant, not actual restaurants, some of us are in restaurants, what chefs are doing uh, with their vegetarian appetizers to like pull a little bit more like ideas rather than like, I guess you have nothing. Cause like, that's not fair. And we want everybody to be happy with what they have. Um, yeah. <laughs> This is a cremant that Molly picked up. It is phenomenal. And we're just gonna top off our coop with that. Beautiful. I'll put this right back up here. So that is our first pairing. And I chose this, I kind of talked about this earlier, uh, for acid. We want something to cut the fat present in the Saint Savior. And by cutting that fat, you actually highlight the cheese's texture and latent flavors. So we're just gonna do that right here and get rid of this measuring cup. Cool. So our next pairing is going to be Tennessee Whiskey Bella Vitano with underground meats, Wisco, Wisco old fashioned salami. Um, so I've already cut a little bit here, but this guy, um, this salami contains brandy or brandy cherries and a little bit more brandy, allspice, and citrus peel. It is modeled after a Wisconsin old fashioned, which is a brandy old fashioned. And in some parts that includes Sprite. I think it's kind of weird. I'm from Boston. I don't understand a lot of things about the Midwest, but you guys make great cheese. So it's cool. Um, I love underground meats. I actually live right next door to All Together Now and they are homies and I'm just so happy I get to work with their product. And I chose the Wisconsin, I'm cutting this on a bias and hopefully I don't lose a finger. Um, I chose this to really just highlight the whiskey notes present in the Bella Vitano, as well as another fun talking note with that uncle. <laughs> the uncle and, definitely loves an old-fashioned <laughs> <laughs> and whiskey and brandy are like very similar especially like the type of brandy that's in this in this um i would say this is a bit sweeter than the cheese itself but that's cool cool I just want to give you guys an update that I've given up plating and I'm now just eating cheese. <laughs> I am too. Alicia, <laughs> someone wants, Susan wants to know, what kind of board are you cutting on? What kind of board? Um, <laughs> what kind well, of board did you bring from your house, Molly? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's from a little place called Ikea. <laughs> Top of the line cheesemonger gear here, I promise. <laughs> So I love, um, like part of my um, road warrior, like cheese kit forever has been just cheap plastic cutting mats. Um, I usually use the wood boards to do more like display. If I'm, you know, if I'm at a food show, um, you know, I'm gonna be using my wood board for a display. So I don't wanna cut on that. 
um, and risk getting a bunch of knife marks and marking those up and having to replace them too often. So um, I tend to look at um, like the wooden boards, um, you know, not as cutting boards, but just as plating boards. So I always roll with a, like just a set of very cheap um, plastic cutting mats that can get, um, you know, knifed up, can get thrown away if, <laughs> if they need to, um, you know, can be easily cleaned and stuff like that to do all of my prep work on. Cool. Brad, thank you for bringing this. It's definitely better than what I have at home. <laughs> I'm saying um, a lot because that thing's uh, <laughs> in <an> early condition. <laughs> Um, all right, so up next we have the Edmund Follett Walnut Dijon. That is going to be a French Dijon made with walnuts from the Perigord, Perigord region, same region that the famous black truffles come from. And again, this is our squeeze bottle. And we're just going to do... And we chose this because we wanted to get some nuts on here. but also didn't want to like overwhelm you with pairing. So we did mu nuts, mustard, all that. Yeah, I had never tried this mustard before, but the nuts give it just like a little bit more texture and body um, than your average mustard. So you get that really like, you know, savory mustard note, but then you get in the, like the hit of acidity that you really want from a mustard like this. Um, but then just like that little bit of like extra mouthfeel, um, which I thought was really delightful. And I think it's so much fun to play around with fruited and like nutted mustards. Um, really just like a underexplored category there. I made this really awesome um, beet and apple mustard that was like bright magenta for an Alpine plate last year. And it just, it blew everyone's mind. It was just really, really fun to look at. All right, so I've grabbed my tweezers. This is some shallot confit with red wine for the Valmy. Oh, yeah. Other, so the, these these other I'm sorry. I was going to say the um, shallots come from um, Quince and Apple, yes. which is an awesome Wisconsin uh, company. They um, started out making preserves, um, but now they also make. Um, different like cocktail syrups and um, they started making a, doing a nut line. Um, so the treat nuts are made by them. Um, and they also have now started making pickles. Um, Matt's, uh, Matt is one of the co-founders and owners. Um, his sister um, started a vegetable farm a few years ago. So they're getting a lot of great locally grown veggies and turning them into pickles. So um, they're a super fun Wisconsin company who makes great stuff. So I'm going to change this up a little bit. And something I didn't mention before, <laughs> all of these pairings should like go well together. So they can go anywhere on the plate. It doesn't have to be right next to the cheese. So I want to put this. Yeah, I try to do that on my boards too. Like where I, when I pick accompaniments, I pick things that will work well with a few of the cheeses, you know, they might create a different, totally different experience, um, you know, with one cheese versus another. But for me, that's like a huge part of the like fun and um, interest in like pairing and having a sensory experience with cheese is, um, you know, tasting through different accompaniments and different cheeses together. And I think that's how you start to really train your palate to like what things work well together. Um, what things don't. <laughs> that's a super Absolutely. important thing to know. Um, and yeah, I think a cheese board, that's like one of the unparalleled um, educational opportunities of a cheese board is being able to do that. I have a related question actually on that. Um, yeah. When you plate pairings, how do you communicate that to a diverse audience? I'm um, assuming that means diverse in terms of tastes, you know, yes. or, not, or not worry about it. Um, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. And I think this is actually something that we can, as like food professionals, help our guests realize that like, there are good pairings, but like, don't psych yourself out about it. Like everything is going to work well on the plate and you can say that. And if a guest doesn't like get a pairing and thinks something else works, that's fine. They're not wrong. Like destigmatize not understanding pairings. 
Um, well, also the palate is extremely subjective. So, you know, what might taste delicious um, to me doesn't taste delicious to you or vice versa. So, exactly. um, you know, that's one of the interesting things about working with food and pairings is that, you know, everybody thinks there's this like set of rules that you have to subscribe to, but it really comes down to like, when people say like, well, what's the perfect pairing? And I'm like, it's the one that you like, you know? Yeah. It's just that easy. And I also say like, I mean, if something like tastes like copper in your mouth, like that's a bad pairing. But besides that, <laughs> it's cool. If, you, if, you're if it tastes like you're sucking on a penny, you know, spit it out. Great. <laughs> your mom taught you that. <laughs> um, so I did bam, bam. Um, I'd love to do rules of three on this, but we'll see if I can fit another little bit of shallow comfy there. And then finally, of the pairings that we've sent out to you guys. Uh, last thing about the shallot confit, I love how like sweet, savory it is. It does the job of having chipolini, pickled chipolini onions on there and a little bit of jam. It's great. Mm -hmm. So with our pentacream, we have the pan forte. I did not say panettone like I wanted to. And we're it's the other Italian Christmas cake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zingerman's out of Ann Arbor, liken this to a medieval power bar, which I think is pretty apt. Um, let's see, dried fruit, nuts, honey, a little bit, do I want it this way or I want it that way? Dried fruit, nuts, honey, spices, and it's super tight. So obviously we can't fit everything that we sent you in your box. This would be a plate that you would refill, replenish over the course of an evening. So that's about what we have as far as what we sent out to you. And we also suggested some additions that it's totally up to you to grab. I have some pumpkin butter that Molly Brown made. I made it. <laughs> Uh, pumpkins are super, super festive. And I actually love pumpkin butter with blue cheese. Yeah. So I went with the um, traditional spice blend here, but on Alicia's recommendation added just a little bit of ground caraway to it, which is something like I never would have considered. And even as I was doing it, I was like, this, this, this is going to be weird. Um, but it's actually not, it's really good. The caraway almost brings like, um, like a zesty kind of like almost a citrus note to it. Um, that I thought really highlighted the other flavors in there super well. So I was excited to try that out. Tight. And I know it's, it's going to be tight. So we're actually just going to gonna put the cheese back down on top of it. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I love that. So and it's like I'm you breathing. have to have them together. Just, you know, helping our homies out. How do we <laughs> eat this? I already told you, it's on the right? plate. I served you it the exact way. And I know that's kind of a faux pas. Um, I don't love like covering brie with like honey and jam just because like how are you can actually taste the cheese. But again, for a party board, you want people to like have fun and have something to talk about. They don't like the Green Bay, Green Bay Packers. So we got <laughs> pumpkin and like blue cheese. They have to leave the party if they don't like the Packers. That's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'm from Boston. I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> I have a couple of last questions because we're mm -hmm. getting close to being out of time. Very sadly, this has flown by because it's been so fascinating to listen to and watch. Um, Susan wants to know when Alicia hosts a party, do you do a casual explanation of what everything is on the board? Or do you just let people go for it? And then they ask ad hoc questions. So um, Susan, if you ever come to my house, I'm gonna let you feel like you're safe until you're not. So I, <laughs> what I like to do is uh, let everybody attack and just like do their thing and then be like, uh, hey guys, so I know that you've gotten into the cheese plate. Let's just walk through this really quick now that you have a bite and let's actually go around the room and talk about what you taste. Um, my friends know that I'm a cheesemonger and that I'm very dramatic. So they're super okay with this. Yeah. And then I, I, just a quick question for um, Molly, uh, which Potter crackers were in the, uh, the box that everybody got? So these were the smoked Potter's crisps. So we thought that these would play really well with 
pretty much all the cheeses here. Um, we, you know, the Valmy, um, the Sartori, Bella Vitano, um, and the Crown Jewel especially um, all have sort of like a latent, like um, almost a smokiness to them. So we thought that this would really kind of like play that up. Um, as well with the blue cheese, the pentacream blue um, is so fabulous. Um, and just having that like little bit of smoke behind it, um, I think makes it like a much more robust um, experience on the palate. So we thought that these were sort of the best pairing across the board. <clears throat> Great. Well, I'm yeah. gonna a question higher up too about which rinds were edible. And I wanted to make sure that we answered that as oh, well. Yes. Um, so um, technically all of these rinds are edible. Um, I think I'm looking really quick. I don't think there's any cloth on any of them. No, I, the Valmy has a little something. I got a little yeah. something on that one. Yeah. That's got like a waxy, yeah, a waxy thing. I wouldn't want to eat. Um, but other than that, um, all of the rinds here could be eaten. Um, but really like, you know, the answer to that question is like, do you, are you enjoying that bite of rind? Um, nobody should ever feel pressured to eat the rind. Um, but you can certainly learn a lot, um, by engaging with the rind. Often the flavor, of the cheese changes the closer you get to the rind. So it's definitely a worthwhile experience to give it a try. And if you have a skinny board like this, I'm all about using vessels as well. As you can <laughs> see what I'm doing with the cornerstones and honey. Yeah, let's get a zoom in on that board again. Yeah, let's see that board for one one last beauty shot. That's oh my gorgeous. gosh, that is looking great. Uh, we've got some persimmon paste. We have pomegranate seeds, candied walnuts with bay and lavender a little bit of Earth's robots situation type things wow. going on. And then last but not least, um, y'all look up pickled raisins as like a recipe. It's really fun. It's so easy to do in your shop. I pickled these with coriander and fennel just oh for God. like a little weird herb note to end with. Cool. That's Beautiful. Yum. That sounds amazing. I can't wait to um, run across the bar and taste those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry for going over. Uh, no, no, I just want to say thank you on behalf of um, all of us at Culture. This has been really awesome. And um, I will, as I said at the beginning, I'll send unanswered questions to Molly and to um, Alicia. And this is our last virtual counterculture of the year. So we're looking forward to seeing you in 2021 and we hope everyone has a really safe and happy holiday season. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you.